Today on This Week in Space, how do you land on the moon? We have the answers. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 13, recorded May 12th, 2022, Landing on the Moon. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV has everything you need to level up your IT skills while you enjoy the journey. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30 at checkout. And by Blue Land. Sometimes in order to go green, you've got to get blue. Blue Land, that is. Blue Land was founded on the belief that a cleaner planet starts by reducing waste while creating powerful, effective cleaners for your entire home. Get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash space. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Landing on the Moon edition. Today we're going to discuss the new lunar landing systems for the Artemis lunar program being pursued by NASA for a, we hope, 2027 landing. Maybe 2028, could be 2029, but we're aiming for 2027. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and I'm joined by Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief of Space.com, the premier space news website. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And I, it's, it's, that was really natural. It doesn't sound like you read it right off our masthead at all. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. So, Actually, is that on your masthead? I didn't know that. I think, I think, I think it is. <laughs> Probably <laughs> is, yeah. Well, we should say the same thing about our magazine, but we just say we're, we're the premier quarterly print publication because we have to be more specific. Um, so you're going to feel warm all over, Tarek. I have a moon joke for you. Oh, I'm, 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 all, week. I'm all ears. Hey, my sister says she loves the moon jokes, by the way. Uh, shout yeah? out to Yasmin Malik out there. She says that our podcast is great and she listens to lots of podcasts. So. Well, so we'll see if she still likes us after this one. <laughs> hey, Tark, what did scientists say when they discovered a skeleton on the surface of the moon? Um, I'm not sure, Rod. What did they say? The cow didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, I, I can beat that. Why okay, do non-vegetarians okay. prefer moon rock over earth rock? Uh, why? Because it's a little meatier. <laughs> That's my <laughs> joke. That's like Actually, my I joke thought that episode was- one. <laughs> oh, did I repeat you? <laughs> no, mine is, is why they why the astronomers sent the uh, the salad back. Because they wanted oh, something that's right. a little yes. meteor. Yeah. That, I have okay, like well, two jokes and that's the one. So... <laughs> I I don't think you can hit me for copyright infringements there. All right, let's get down to brass tacks. (laughs) Uh, Before we jump into lunar landings, though, we're going to look at some headlines, as always. So, first up, Ingenuity interrupted. The Mars helicopter went dark for a short period of time. Apparently, it was dust and cold weather at work on Mars. And while people may think, gosh, wasn't it built? To withstand those kind of conditions, let's remember that this thing was only, this is really a technology test. It was only expected to work for a few weeks and maybe five flights. So we're getting a lot of bang for our buck and a lot of extra time here. So, Tarek, my understanding is that the heaters may have gotten switched off and went into safe mode. Is that what happened? Yeah, you know, so what we what we know is that Ingenuity missed a, like a like a check-in call. It it relays its health back to NASA through the Perseverance rover with the, which then bounces it off an orbiter around Mars and then it all comes back to Earth and um and early in May uh, it it missed a a check-in call for about 2 days and uh, and then on on May 5th it it kind of powered back up. So they they think that a combination of uh the 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 amount of dust in the atmosphere of Mars. And there's a lot, right? They have dust storms, just like Mark Watney saw in The Martian. <laughs> and and then it, the fact that it's getting cold at the um, at the landing site, that, where, where it's flying around right now, kind of work together to trip this switch on the on the helicopter and, and shut it down for uh, for a little bit. The fact that it came back, by the way, uh, from that uh, from that glitch is, is pretty indicative of how resilient JPL built this this helicopter to be like you mentioned it was like a it was supposed to last a month maybe fly you know three four five times and we're on flight we're past flight 25 now uh, I believe and you know it seems to be doing real well they're using it as like a scout for uh, looking at different targets on Mars and that seems to be doing pretty well so you know it, but we should point out by the way this could be a sign of things to come 
because the the northern hemisphere winter season on Mars is coming up, and uh, and that's that's going to be something that uh, Ingenuity and uh, all of the the spacecraft, uh, the the Chinese rover on Mars, uh, Perseverance, Curiosity, all have to deal with. Well, not to geek out too much on this, but one of the things I found remarkable about uh, Inspiration, we've talked about this, or excuse me, Ingenuity, we've talked about this a bit before, is this program was a very small last minute addition to the rover. So That's it right. didn't really start until 2014, 2015. It was very experimental. They got very little money up front. Nobody thought it was going to fly. It wasn't really being taken that seriously. But this really small team, uh, led by a woman named Mimi Ong, who has since left JPL to go uh, work at Amazon, as I understand it, on the Kuiper project there, was just, she was really tenacious. And they kept pushing it and kept pushing it and building prototypes. And by the time it was approved, they had less than a year to get it ready for flight. So this is really yeah. an amazing thing. Last minute, yeah. they're stapling it to the bottom of the rover, and off it goes. And uh, like you say, this is a really testament to the fine engineering there. The guy yeah, who's the I, chief engineer now, by the way, is a guy named uh, Jacko Karras, who's going to be uh, coming to an ex accept an, a, an award for the helicopter team at the upcoming National Space Society conference. And... You know, you see a picture of him, he looks like he's about 14, but he's in his, I think, late 20s. But he's one of those interesting uh, kind of success stories of how young people can get engaged with JPL. He was uh, going to UC Berkeley, and he was working on these little foldable mini rovers called Puffer that would kind of jump off the back of the main rover and drive around places the main rover can't go. And then they're cheap and disposable, basically. And this was his grad school project, and he ended up getting an internship at JPL. And next thing you know, he was developing it for them, and it's still on their uh, slate of future projects, as far as I understand it. So, good good thing uh, to become I, an intern at JPL if you can. I, I, th I think it's a, you know it's good to become an intern anywhere because I started as an intern yeah. at Space dot com, you know. <laughs> but but you're you're right, you're right. It is a a really good. Uh, it, it's a really good example of of both kind of that that kind of tenaciousness, both with. Uh, um, with the current chief engineer and with Mimi Young, but also just about doing something that's new. A lot of the opposition to do to putting it on there was the fact that they had never done it before, and what if it messes up the rover? Um, and that was mm. a call. I mean, it went all the way up to the administrator at that time to say, "Are we going to put it on there or not?" And Jim Bryson's like, "Yeah, just just do it. Let's let's see what happens." And here we are, you know. And it I, it seems like it was it's a good example of hey we should be doing this on every mission something new like this to really push that envelope you know Bridenstine was as it turned out there's a lot of of not a lot but there was some doubt when he was uh, announced as the administrator but he turned out to be i think one of the best ones they've had in decades not taking any way, anything away from the other administrators, but for a non-astronaut, I think we learned something, which is maybe politicians make better administrators than astronauts do, and we've got another one in that seat now. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you know, well, in ingenuity is there. I think things get done, and uh, we'll have to wait and see about the next big drone, which I think is the one that's going to Titan, Dragonfly. Dragonfly it's a great big yeah, one, the, nu nuclear powered. That's, that's going to be uh, that has its lineage powered, directly it, to this to this drone. It's a either quadcopter or a six blade drone, right? Yep, yep. Going to yeah, fly which, on tight. I mean, Can you imagine? <laughs> man, well, I mean, it's actually it, it's interesting because it's a lot easier to fly in Titan because the atmosphere is so dense; it's denser than Earth's. But it's really cold, and uh, I think it's a corrosive atmosphere, isn't it? With all well, the you got frozen there. methane rocks all over the place. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, have well to, and we'll oceans, see. which is something you don't have to worry about on Mars landing on an ocean. <laughs> is no problem. That's right. All right. That's right. Um, next up, DARPA's nukes in space. I like, <laughs> or as I like to call it, Nerva is back for people who know what Nerva is. So, DARPA, the uh, military's advanced concepts wing, put out a call for proposals recently for phase two and phase three of a nuclear rocket engine. They had put out a call for phase one uh, a couple of years ago. And this is really hearkening back to the 1960s when we had developed in the United States and the, the Soviets were also developing their own nuclear rocket engines, which is basically a fission reactor that heats up a fuel, hydrogen in this case, and it expands out the back of a nozzle very quickly. And it's very simple. It's very robust. It's something you can shut down and store in space for a very long time. Um, 
which makes it really useful for something that you're going to have in orbit, like a satellite that has to reposition itself where chemical fuels can become a problem over the long term. So they put out this call for the second and third phases. They want it to fly by 2026. So this is really a fast track program. And um, phase two is development and ground testing, and phase three is space testing. So this is pretty exciting. This is something that the thrust-to-weight ratio is about 10,000 times that of traditional ion electric propulsion systems and two to five times higher than the best chemical engines. So I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah, you know, this is a really a really interesting project because it sounds like science fiction. It's like the military with a nuclear rocket around the moon, which... We've seen in uh, some of the alternate history shows, like uh, we've, you and I have talked offline about For All Mankind and whatnot. They've got a lot of nuclear stuff in on, on that show. But yeah, they, they call it actually DRACO. That's the DARPA's Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cislunar Operations, uh, which you know already sounds pretty sinister. <laughs> but mm. <laughs> but they, they basically, the, the, the selling point here is that the, the U.S. military, you know, DARPA is part of the, the Pentagon and, and whatnot, um, sees a need or a potential requirement to watch over a cislunar. So that's the space uh, between like like near the earth and, and, and the moon, but, you know, that's kind of mm -hmm. the whole neighborhood to keep an eye on it as commercial operations ramp up, as NASA wants to go back to the moon. Um, meanwhile, we've got China getting ready to, or not getting ready, on the, the far side of the moon now. Uh, uh, Russia is teaming up uh, with them on a, on a moon base too. So they see... Uh, apparently a security need to watch over all of that civilian and commercial stuff as well as maybe their own vehicles in that that earth moon space and so to do that they want these really high performance uh, nuclear thermal rocket engines uh, for a long long lifetime so i mean it's it's kind of weird that it's coming out of darpa uh in 2026 you know you'd think that nasa would have had these nuclear engines by now but I suppose where the military wants to go, they're going to get there faster than anyone else. Well, and, and part of DARPA's motivation was uh, they've got a lot of strategic military satellites in orbit. And we've become more aware over the last few years that a satellite that passes over the exact same trajectory over a given point in the Earth is an easy thing to shoot down or destroy. Whereas if you can maneuver these things in times of crisis or some kind of defense posturing, they're a lot harder to hit. So this is a nice long-term storage solution that you can put on a larger satellite. And so the idea is, at least initially, that you can maneuver these things quickly and at a high rate of thrust because the a lot of satellites now are uh, repositioned by, by um, electric drives, which have a lot less thrust than these. So this is a good way to move things around fast over the long term. But of course... As we've discussed before in our first episode, Atomic Rockets, um, this gets us to Mars and other points of the solar system a lot faster and is something that is a whole lot more efficient than chemical engines. So um, I, I think this is a good thing. And if you want more information on either of these stories, of course, you go to space.com, where all good things come from. Right? Yes, 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 of course. All right. And so we're going to be back in just a few minutes to talk about lunar landers and how to land on the moon, because this is a really difficult thing to do. And it's something that's facing us for the new Artemis program. And it's a kind of better late than never program along with the EVA suits. But it is happening now. But first, let's hear a message from our friends at IT Pro TV. This episode of This Week of Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. It's important when looking for an online IT training platform that you're getting the most up-to-date content and certifications. So let me make it easy for you. Just go to IT Pro TV. In fact, they just released a new course, CompTIA A Plus Core 1 and Core 2 Series. This course is designed for professionals who support today's core technologies from security to networking to virtualization and more. CompTIA's a certification is an industry standard for launching IT careers in today's digital world. In this course, you'll learn about hardware, operating systems, networking, security, and troubleshooting. We talk about how great IT Pro TV is, but here's a reminder why. They have seven studios where they film Monday through Friday. Their courses go from the studio to their course library in 24 hours and are divided into 20 to 30 minute segments for easy binging. They make sure you're prepared for your exams with their virtual labs and practice tests. 
The best part about IT Pro TV is that you can learn to get certified on your own schedule, and it's always entertaining. May is ramping up for summer, and so is IT Pro TV. They're focusing on Azure and have two free webinars this month for you to check out, now available on demand. What is Azure Bicep with Adam Gordon and Wes Bryan? And All Things Cybersecurity with Daniel Lowry and John Hammond. Don't forget about your IT team. Check out an IT Pro TV business plan for your team today. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30. That's itpro.tv slash twit and use code twit30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. All right, let's talk about landing on the moon. So this is something we've done before in the 1960s, the Apollo program, and you'd think it would kind of be a slam dunk. You know, we built lunar landers before. They worked really well. It turned out to be one of the most reliable parts of the Apollo system uh, in its entirety. And uh, can, can I can I ask you real quick, Rod? Uh, do you sure. prefer maybe maybe this is for later? I'm curious if you prefer a lunar module or a lunar excursion module. Lem? Well, actually, it's, or it's not up to me. They yeah. so <laughs> it was originally the lunar excursion module, and somebody I think it was in the executive branch, if I remember correctly, back in the '60s, said, you know. That sounds like they're going up there to have fun. This is a great national endeavor. Let's drop the excursion. So it officially became the lunar module, I think, in 1967 or 68. So that was their decision. I, I just call it the LEM or the LUM. Mm. <laughs> but, um, you know, this was a really, really challenging program. I'm going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. But now it's the 21st century. It's over 50 years later. Um, so on the one hand, you'd think, well, let's take those technologies we proved before and use them again in an updated fashion with more modern computer-aided design and uh, modern material science and so forth. But that's not really what we're planning to do, is it? At least not no. first up. No, you know, I, I had thought, actually first with Project Constellation, the precursor to Artemis, and then with Artemis, that all you would need to do to design a, a new lunar lander is take the designs for the old one and give it better computers and a better engine and then uh, and then maybe some newer materials and then you're done right because you know that that works so just like it's like a lego set right just swap out all the all the parts for all the new stuff and then uh, use the proven design no no that's not that's not what 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 they're doing so for for artemis uh for the artemis program nasa initially said that they wanted two commercial uh, moon landers, uh, one uh, uh, to be kind of like a, like the, the initial one and another to be a backup. When we see that now with the commercial crew program, they, they wanted uh, Boeing and SpaceX. They wanted two to have redundancy. And it turns out that was a pretty good choice because Boeing's been delayed for a couple of years. And if they had just picked Boeing, they would still be stuck on the ground and we'd be paying Russia you know, maybe over a hundred million dollars for for flights to per uh, seat, the international yeah. space. Yeah, per seat for one 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 seat, um, and so so that was that was their their big plan, and and then NASA selected just one uh, moon lander, and that was SpaceX's Starship, which is a weird selection because <laughs> SpaceX's Starship is enormous. Yes, it is. well, we can see it over your shoulder. Yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, yeah, I, and for for folks who are, who are listening, I've got this nice screensaver. It's the NASA SpaceX illustration. It's this gleaming white Starship rocket uh, with the NASA worm logo and uh, American flag. Um, I'm going to cue my my eagle screech, rah, right? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, well done. That's right. Sitting 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 on the sitting on the moon with like a crescent Earth behind it. Anyway, that's 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 their big artist view and. Um, but NASA just picked one. And so the plan is to use for the first crewed landing, a SpaceX Starship. So that's the, it's basically the top half of the world's tallest and biggest rocket uh, to land astronauts on the moon. The crew part is the very top of this rocket. And then there's like a hundred foot drop 
from where they would get out and take an elevator all the way down to the lunar surface. Uh, and the selling point is that Starship is huge, which means it has uh, a lot of capacity. It can carry a lot of supplies. It can carry, uh, SpaceX wants to launch like 100 tons of payload on it uh, to orbit. Um, and that's a big selling which, point. Let's just say can... 100 tons. That's a lot of cargo. It's a lot of stuff. A lot. Right. But if you want to go to the moon to stay, and this is a lot of the reasoning behind it, you need to take a lot of things. The LEM was small. It could fit two people semi comfortably, right? In their in their spacesuits. Uh, and and they brought back some rocks and that was about it. They they weren't really gonna be camping out there for months for uh, uh missions at a time, long, long time, you know, long stays there. This Lander is supposed to deliver all of the things that NASA wants to have, NASA and their partners. So you've got your astronauts, you've got their habitats, you've got their their cars. Uh, Jack, uh, Japan, uh, JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, has teamed up with Toyota to build a truck that should fit on this uh, this kind of a, a a rocket. So yeah, which by the uh, way, the, the original lunar rover looked like. <sighs> look like a go-kart with a couple of beach chairs on it so oh. this is an enclosed i think pressurized it's, it's going to be an big, enclosed pressure i've rover. seen the prototype yeah. for it that they're, they're yeah. driving around in test tracks and it looks yeah, i think you crazy. saw it in person so, right yeah it was over at space symposium uh, yeah because you Korea got to go <laughs> because your publication paid for you to go do i have to bring this up every week i guess I you do. gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta host a panel at symposium <laughs> and then and then you can you can go right. I mean, and so that that's why uh. I was there was to to host a panel on climate change and commercial data. It's really good. You should all watch it. We talked to the the chief of NOAA. It's over at the the uh, Space Foundation site. I know what I can, who I can host. I can take Andy Aldrin, uh, Buzz's son, who I've been working with quite a bit, and I'm I have a panel with him coming up at the NSS conference, and he's branded himself now as the cosmic curmudgeon. We're going to have him yeah. on in a few weeks to find out what a cosmic curmudgeon is. Um, I just want to point out something about the uh, the SpaceX lander. So if you imagine yes. a big, gleaming, silver, banana-shaped rocket ship from a 1950 science fiction movie, that's what we're looking at here. And if you Google uh, SpaceX Starship Lunar, SpaceX Lunar Starship, or just go on space.com and search it there, you'll see this thing. So it's a... It's as far on the opposite end of the spectrum from the lunar module as you can be. The lunar module from the Apollo program was basically aluminum foil wrapped around the smallest possible closet-sized space two astronauts could stand in. And it had a very short life. It could only stay on the moon for about four or five days, partly because it only carried so much oxygen and so many consumables, but also because the electronics on it, which remember, this is the 60s, so electronics were fairly bulky and ran very hot, to cool them, they had a water system that evaporated water out the back of the limb through a radiator. And once you're out of water, the electronics overheated. So that was among the many things that made it have a limited lifespan. For something like Lunar Starship, we're talking about something that may stay there for many, many weeks, if not longer. Um, but what gets me about this is, so they launched Lunar Starship, they refuel it in orbit, fingers crossed, sent it off to lunar orbit, then we take the astronauts and three or four of them, I think three initially, and put them in the Orion capsule atop the very expensive SLS Space Launch System rocket, launch them into space, it rendezvous with Lunar Starship in orbit, and then these astronauts sit up at the tip of this, and it's it's like it's like having three people in the in the front of a hundred foot long bus <laughs> that is landing. <laughs> backside first on the moon with all this space empty space below them and as you point out oh, when, it, you i'm sure up, it won't be empty i sure i'm sure i'm sure well, i assure you it won't be empty but, but you know it's interesting and this is part of the one of the things andy aldrin talks about is you know we really don't have a conveyor belt of cargo ready to play on starship once it starts flying with any regularity yeah. and i'm not sure by the time artemis 3 flies they're really going to have enough. For, for one thing, they're not staying on the moon very long. So unless they're deploying supplies for future missions, I'm not sure it's going to be very full. But just the idea that you're sending people up, and let, you know, let's be candid, Congress kind of is in control of the money throttle on, on SLS. So by law, we have to use it. And, and, and it is probably, it's safer technology, it's proven technology. So in the time it would take to so-called man rate 
or human rate the Starship for especially reentry and landing, it makes sense to use uh, SLS and the Orion caps a few times because we're pretty sure that's going to be safe and work properly. Mm -hmm. But just the idea of loading these people up on this big expensive rocket and shooting them out to then step in this thing the size of a semi truck to land on the moon, it, it, it it's it's quirky. But if it, it works, that's it great. And, and we should point out we should point out that NASA did compete for this this Artemis moon lander. And again, like I mentioned, the the, the plan was to have two, and there right. were. There were three kind of big entries, and uh, in addition to SpaceX, there was uh, a, a kind of an up-and-coming company, Dynatic, Dynetics, in terms of moon landings. They hadn't ever built a right. moon lander before, and they had a, well, a none bid. of these people have. Let, let's yeah, well, point yeah, out. exactly. That's right. We should point that out. And they had a kind of a squat, habitat-y looking thing with with uh, with some cylinders, and it looks like the limb, but like a squat, oversized version of, right. of the Apollo lander. Uh, and then there was the national team. I think I think it was it was national team, yes. And that was yeah. led by Blue Origin, uh, and uh, they had recruited Northrop Grumman for habitats, Lockheed Martin for uh, I believe for purport, for, for propulsion, and uh, Draper for systems. Uh, lots of veteran That's the, companies. Uh, computer lab at MIT. That so I, I mean, one very smart thing about National Team, and this is Jeff Bezos's company, Blue Origin, is you bring in Grumman, who built the lunar module, the original lunar module, and you bring in the Draper Lab at MIT, who built the computer and guidance system for the ori original uh, Apollo lunar module and command module, you kind of have a can't-miss team there, and yet they didn't get the bid because they were yeah. just too expensive. They were too expensive, and and I think I think that they may have expected NASA to say, hey, you're too expensive, do you want to do uh, like a redo for a bid? And, and then that didn't yeah. happen. They were like, well, SpaceX is a lot cheaper. Now, SpaceX won a $2.9 billion contract, like a fixed-price contract for for this Artemis three flight or this Artemis three moon landing flight, and um, and so now they're working towards that. And uh, while we haven't seen a lot of Starship testing in terms of like the big grand stuff in the last year, not since really they successfully landed Starship uh, uh, SN fifteen, uh, they've been working behind the scenes to do it all. In that time, they did have to stop the Artemis development work for like about seven months because Blue Origin and their partners. And Dynetics were not happy that they didn't get this. No, uh, wait, this so they, they didn't have to stop the whole the whole development of Artemis, just the lander, right? Oh, do, yeah, no, just the lander. But again, the you know, you don't want to. Yeah. You you can you can go to the you can go to the moon and then not have a lander. You're still kind of uh, in the same situation uh, as we are now, where you don't have a lander. You just can't land, right? Um, right. And, well, which is Artemis too, right? It's going to go in orbit <laughs> and come home. Exactly, Artemis two is going to pull in Apollo eight and go swing around the moon. Get a get a up close and personal, and and then come back and and you know set the stage for the the grand uh, the grand hopefully not finale right because you want more moon landings, uh, so that that really paused work on this moon lander SpaceX and NASA were not allowed to really work together right. on Artemis three what it needs uh, how to suit or how to adapt uh, Starship because SpaceX is already building Starship for its own needs and its own desires uh, and how to address what NASA really wants in that. So that really held them up a bit. And uh, they've only recently been able to kind of get, get started. And in that, in that time, NASA has come back out and said, well, we do want another, uh, we do want another moon lander for that, that redundancy. Uh, they're recompeting it. So Blue Origin is back in the game again. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to see what happens. Now, SpaceX, as part of that, got another moon lander deal out of it to do like a test. So we're going to, which makes sense, right? Because you don't want that first landing to have the people on it where you've never tested it before uh, in this day and age. Now, they did that, right, with Apollo 11, although Apollo 10 got really close and they could they could do some testing. They weren't going to do a mission like that for Artemis uh, 3, before Artemis 3. Artemis 2 was just going to go around the moon and come back without yeah. the lander. So... Uh, so that's kind of where things are right now. Uh, we, you know, the the work is going on uh, in the background. SpaceX is building new engines, their Raptor two, for uh, for a Starship uh, to support this this mission, as well as I mean, they've sold the trip around the moon uh, for Starship to a Japanese billionaire. They've sold the first actual crewed flight uh, for Polar the Polaris program with Jared uh, Isaacman. So they've got a lot riding on Starship. So having NASA as another potentially anchor customer to go to the moon, 
uh, really, you know, they, they don't want to mess that one up. They've got a lot of things riding on this. So do you mind if I geek out for a few minutes, uh, more than a few minutes on the original lunar module? Uh, no, I think that we should kind of show that's the, you know, that's the grand pappy, right? The thing that, that started it all, uh, to yeah. get us, uh, on, on the moon. Um, and it's very different, right? Starship is stainless steel. I think you're going to enlighten us, enlighten us about how robust and, and tough the lunar module was. So let's, let's get into well, it. Well, which is shocking considering that it was basically a tissue paper spacecraft. So, you know, the whole, the whole idea here was, look, we've got eight years to get to the moon, build us something quickly. That's just enough to do the job. So the contract, uh, request went out grumman grumman space systems or uh, it's grumman aircraft at that point got it and they had developed uh, a lot of designs on paper but basically the the thing that sort of sold it at least by legend is that they had made a little five inch high model out of wood on a lathe that looked like a kind of a, a bulbous spherical lunar module with five legs on it the legs were actually oversized were jumbo paper clips which i thought was really <laughs> cute uh, but uh Grumman, it was kind of a surprise when they got the contract because they were a small, technologically conservative uh, aerospace company, and their fortune had been made, besides civilian aircraft, primarily on military aircraft. So they bit, bit, built big, heavy, really robust fighters for the Pacific Theater in World War II and then jets in the Korean War. But they had never done anything like this. Now, admittedly, nobody had done, any, done anything like this. But th compared to somebody like North American out in California, Grumman was in Bethpage, New York, they had really not done anything like this and hadn't even really been thinking in that realm. But Tom Kelly, who became the project manager, he was a, a, in management at Grumman, really wanted to push for this contract. So they got it. And it very quickly became one of those things where you sort of said yay with an asterisk and below that. It's like, oh my God, what have we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> no. One of his first jobs was just to shift the thinking of the design culture at Grumman. So as I said, they were used to making th these fairly robust aircraft, never the fastest, never the most ferocious, but always very formidable and reliable. So literally, and, and this is a paraphrase, but it's it's very close to, according to Kelly anyway, as to what he was hearing from a lot of his senior engineers, he would show people the drawings of the lamb, and their first reaction was, look at these drawings. Look at the shape of this silly thing. Everything sticks out. It's going to break. And he'd have to remind them, look, this is flying in a vacuum. It's the first true spacecraft. You know, you can call the Apollo command module or the space shuttle a spacecraft, but they both fly in the atmosphere. The lunar yeah. module would fly up to space inside an enclosed compartment on the Saturn V, and the only time it was exposed to anything was in the vacuum of space. So it could look like a bread van and it would be fine. <laughs> um, it was certainly the most innovative compo component of the Apollo program, but it was really a victim of everything else. So the Saturn V sort of set the pace for what the mass of anything riding atop it could be. So that was the command module and the lunar module. Anything they added to the LEM, though, became exponentially worse because it had to get down the lunar surface and get back. So the tyranny of the calculus here was brutal. You add a little more fuel for a landing. Well, that means that now you've got to add more fuel to the Saturn V to get it up there for, you know, for lifting capacity. And then it goes back and forth and back and forth. So really their specs were fairly locked, they thought. But as they got into developing this lander, the command module and service module, the rocket behind it, which were being built by North American Aviation out in L.A., they were gaining weight because everybody, you know, th these were federal bids, right? So you come in with the lowest price you think you might be able to manage and the most idealized calculations, and that's never what ends up happening. Costs go up back in the old cost plus days. We don't do that anymore, thank goodness. Well, that for most yeah, programs. Yeah, uh, Bill Nelson had a lot to say about cost plus contracts. Uh, yes, to, he did. To Congress. <laughs> and he's right. Month, so, yeah. It was one of the, what, what do you say, one of the worst inventions of Western civilization or something? Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, he does not like But them. it's kind of like, not. working on the lunar module was like sharpening a pencil at both ends until you just have a little mound of sawdust and a piece of graphite, you know? So it started out as this big spherical design with five landing legs covered in windows, looked like the front of a helicopter because they wanted the astronauts to be able to see from a seated position. And rapidly they realized they were never going to be able to build this thing. So they had to really start with a clean sheet. 
the basic design of top stage, bottom stage was retained, but that was about it. So the first thing they did was take away one of the legs. So they went from five to four because you only need four. Probably could have done it with three, but four was safer. They started pulling out windows. So instead of the original five, they only had the two main windows up front and then one small one at the top. So if they could see for uh, for rendezvous and docking, they could they could spot out of there. Because the windows are pretty heavy. They're five, five layers of quartz glass. So w- removing those saved a ton of weight. But that wasn't enough. So the next thing they did was say, well, you know, there's not much gravity on the moon, so these astronauts really don't need seats to sit in. Let's get, get rid of those. <laughs> so they got rid of the seats, had them supported by bungee cords instead because it's only 1 6 G, right? It's just under 20% of Earth gravity. And they could lean over the two little triangular windows that were left to watch for the landing, which worked out fine. For the main cabin, they ditched the spherical shape, which would have been stronger, but made it into a series of flat panels that essentially allowed them to wrap that structure, the pressurized part of the cabin, around the smallest possible space, as I said before, that two astronauts could reasonably occupy in spacesuits. So it's about 220 cubic feet, which is small. If you've spent much time in a closet, you know what 220 cubic feet <laughs> feels like. It wasn't very big. Pretty, pretty close to my dorm room, right? Maybe my dorm room was bigger oh, in God. college. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I remember my UCLA dorm when the when the two beds were folded out, they actually touched. It was kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> I went to USC, by the way, which is by far the better school than UCLA. But uh, okay, continue, Rod. Let's well, of course. And, you know, I grant you that. You know why? Because oh, wow. after that, I went to Stanford, which actually <laughs> completely buries USC. But bitter, bitter, yeah. B- <laughs> but <laughs> bitter. You, we Ed. should point out that both Stanford and UCLA are bitter rivals of USC. So, but okay. Stanford's Sorry, not a that. rival of USC. Well, to the Martian Stanford band, doesn't yes, even consider is. USC to be in the same universe <laughs> as itself. But I, I digress. So now you've got this little thin aluminum cabin that you've got to hang fuel tanks and radar and all that stuff on. So one of the challenges, interestingly enough, was making it just strong enough that that stuff could hang on it in a 1G environment before launch. So this is really what's driving the bus now. It ended up looking more like a fungus than a spacecraft. Um, (laughs) The descent stage had been sort of a cylindrical body, so they had two engines, a descent engine and then a a lifting or ascent engine. Can I I ask you, was it always two different modules? Was it always going to be... A, a an ascent stage, descent stage connected, and then they would separate? Or were there plans to have like a, just a single stage down and up? All the designs I've seen in that original Pinewood model were for two stages. And the concern was, and by the way, the Russian lander, which was being designed about the same time in great secrecy, was a single engine design. Mm-hmm. So you did launch off the descent stage, but it had a hole cut through it for that same engine to get them back up. The concern was, depending on how long your burn time landing was, they didn't want that descent engine to fail and those guys to be trapped there. Plus, yeah. you could shed more weight if you left that lower stage behind. Um, so they instead of making that stage cylindrical, they basically just made an aluminum truss just enough, again, just enough of everything, just enough to hold the descent engine and some fuel tanks and some electronics. And then they cover the outside in mylar foil. It's actually capped on, but it looks just like mylar. Just enough to for thermal protection so the sun didn't boil off the fuels and so forth. So you're kind of getting the picture here. This thing is as minimal as it gets. I mean, this makes IKEA look like deluxe, heavy, claw-footed furniture. Um the really funny uh, thing is that it's it's so ugly and yet it becomes so iconic, right? Yes. <laughs> for what it for what it is, and it sounds the way when you describe it like that, Rod, it sounds like like something that is just it's thrown together, and we're gonna hope it works because it's Not as light all. and <laughs> and yet and yet and yet it ends up being this refined thing, and that ends up saving the Apollo thirteen astronauts, right? When uh, when their own actual spacecraft their their command module suffers a big mortal blow, uh, blow so yeah and and you know you know let's add to that you can test command modules you can drop them from helicopters and see how they fare in a splashdown you can fly them without a crew and have it re-enter and see how that that heat shield works you can't test the lunar module on the earth really and they did test it in orbit in apollo 9 but all they were able to do is get in it fly it around a little bit 
test the staging mechanism and then say, okay, see ya, climb back in the Apollo capsule, come home. As you pointed out, Apollo 10, they did kind of a dry run down towards the surface, got down to, I think, what was it, 50,000 feet, and then uh, dropped the descent stage and boosted back up. Had a few scary moments there when the uh, ascent stage started tumbling because the, the, I think the radar switches were set in the wrong position. Yeesh. And it uh, resulted in some fairly blue language from the two, from Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan flying it. But we understand that. NASA didn't find it very entertaining. But, you know, these things happen when you're in the middle of a life-threatening emergency. Um, but that was it. And then Apollo 11, the first landing, was the first test. And this thing couldn't fly itself, so it had to be with a crew. Um, but above all, at, at Grumman, the ethos was uh, the crew is it. we got to get the crew home. And... There was no second chances with this. I mean, when you're flying around the moon in the Apollo command module, if that rear engine doesn't fire to get you out of lunar orbit and home, that's a bad moment. But yeah. had they landed on the moon only to find that the ascent engine wouldn't fire, that's a real bad moment because you that's your permanent tomb, right? And Armstrong... So the asset engine, which is very simple, it's hypergolic. So you basically have two chemicals that you mix. You don't need an igniter. They just these are two chemicals that despise each other and go bang when they meet. <laughs> All you had to do is open the valves and off you go. And it didn't even have a throttle. It just had a, a switch that was either on or off, and you could kind of pulse it to get the thrust you needed. Um, Armstrong had asked at one point. He said, "You know, I'm trusting two little electric squibs, electrically fired squibs, to make this thing go." Can you just put a couple of knobs on there to mix the fuels just in case? And they said, sorry, too much weight. <laughs> so it almost came down to how much breakfast you had the day before you were going to land on the moon to keep this weight critical. So by the time they were done, the top cabin, uh, the astronauts started referring to it as the aluminum balloon because when you got in it and you pumped it up to five pounds per square inch, which was the pressurized uh the pressure that it needed for the astronauts to function at it. If you did that in a vacuum, it actually bulged out because the sides of part of the cabin were about twice the thickness of a Coke can. That's really thin. And it was to the point where if you were a Grumman engineer, they had to account for every tool they took in there because if you dropped a screwdriver, it could actually puncture the, <laughs> puncture the I was side gonna, of the hole. I was going to ask, I, I had heard that they could pop, they could push like a, like a pen through the skin was it really that 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 thin well so there's one at i think it's kennedy space center there's one on display that that part of the hull doesn't have the outer skin so you can see the the inner skin and the and the the riveted uh, cross braces and yeah if you if you reach out now you're not supposed to do this but if you're there after hours ahem, you can actually get up close <laughs> to do it and if you push it it kind of goes doink like that so I don't know if a pencil could do it, but certainly if you had like a punch or a screwdriver, you could easily put it through the side. So, um, you know, just enough to do the job. So they're working on this. They're still not light enough. The weight's still an issue. They're having to add features and add technology and all at the same time having to shed weight. These are two things that don't get along very well when you're graphing them for, for an engineer. So uh, just to wrap this up, and, oh, and by the way, this is the mid, mid to late 1960s, so Apollo's budget is getting cut, but the lunar module's budget is ballooning out of control. <laughs> uh, so it was uh, more than twice, well more than twice what was originally contracted. So they finally, Tom Kelly put a bounty on weight. So he said, look, I don't care if you're an engineer, a janitor, a manager, a secretary, if you've got an idea that'll shave weight off this thing, I'm writing checks and I'm paying $25,000 a pound in 1960s money. Now they were really looking for, um, for grams, but if you came up with a pound, <laughs> that was going to be sufficient. So they started milling parts down until they were just strong enough. They'd literally mill down connecting parts and, and fuel lines and so forth until they snapped and then back off just a little bit. And Kelly paid out a lot of money in bounties. People got very clever in camp with great ideas. And in the end of the day, this thing worked. It became, as I said, one of the most reliable parts of the program. Made six landings on the moon, saved Apollo 13. Nothing on the lunar module ever came close to failing in flight. And uh, it did a remarkable job. Wow. So when we come back, I'd like to talk a little bit more about where we're headed with this. But uh, stand by one for a short message from Blue Land. 
This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Blue Land. Did you know that an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away every year? And as if that's not bad enough, each bottle can contain more than 90% water. That's a lose-lose situation for our planet. Plastic has been found in 100% of marine turtles, 59% of whales, 36% of seals, and 40% of seabird species examined. And get this, by 2050, scientists predict that the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. Think about that. That's terrifying. We need to start creating a cleaner planet from home. Now, Blue Land's idea is simple and it's beautiful. Buy the bottle once, refill it forever. No more plastic waste. The only thing you need to discard is your outdated idea that eco-friendly products are more expensive or less effective. Just fill Blue Land's beautiful Instagramable bottles with warm water, Pop in one of the hand soap or spray cleaner tablets, and within minutes, you have powerful cleaning products in the most incredible scents like iris agave, perine lemon, and lavender eucalyptus. From their best-selling clean essentials kit to their hand soap duo and plastic-free laundry and dishwasher tablets, Blue Land has something for every inch of your home. And now, backed by popular demand, is Blue Land's toilet tablet cleaner. Get it before it sells out again. Blue Land's stunning high-quality forever bottles start at just $10 when you buy a kit and are meant to be reused forever with money-saving refill tablets that start at just $2. Try Blue Land today. You'll love it, and the planet will thank you. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com space. That's 20% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com space. blueland.com space. All right, Tarek, I want to thank you for indulging my inner nerd because no, I, I love, I, I, I love talking a, about the lunar module. I've, I've got a model of the lunar module on my space shelf right behind me over here. And unfortunately, yeah. my cats keep knocking it off. And so <laughs> they keep falling. And, and it's missing a leg because who knows what happened. Uh, I think it's just it's a, it's a casualty. But it's, I've, got a little, I've got a little rover there, too. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. Well, clearly it's a good thing I, you didn't go into engineering or you'd uh, end up causing us some problems. I, I um, built a, I built a, I built a hat for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 and it had my, my little lander with the astronaut and the American flag on it and the rover driving across the bill. It was great. It was good stuff. I'm sorry. Did I call myself a nerd? I believe you win. <laughs> I believe you win, my friend. So you should see, you should see my start, my, my, my Falcon heavy hat. <laughs> My Falcon Heavy hat with, think the, I with want the Starman to. in the car, and it would oh, turn. Good grief. With a motor. It was on a I motor? Had. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've got some, an Instagram. I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to send it your way later on. You need some, <laughs> so. some psychological therapy. Uh, <laughs> no, that's lovely. That's lovely. Um, nothing too outlandish for our friend Tarek. So, so when last we left our adventure... Basically, SpaceX had been told to stand down for the amount of time it took for first Blue Origin and Dynetics to file a complaint with the federal government, right? Yes. Saying that they felt that the decision on this single contract, so they were supposed to award two contracts. NASA came back and said, hey, our budget got cut. Sorry, we've only got money enough for one. We're going with SpaceX. And I, you know, admittedly, that was kind of changing what we thought the terms of the competition were going to be, but it was okay. out of their control. So if you're going to blame anybody, blame Congress. So first Blue Origin and Dynetics file complaints. The complaints are rejected. And then Blue Origin only, I believe, filed a lawsuit and said, okay, now we're going to sue, to which Elon Musk snarkily <laughs> responded on Twitter, you can't sue your way to the moon, Jeff. Mm -hmm. That was a little much. But uh, that too was rejected by then. The then yeah, yeah. And, and then Jeff Bezos says, hey, 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 okay, okay, how about if I just, right. like, give you a, a, moon, a moon lander and I'll cover $2 billion worth of it? Uh, and NASA said, NASA said no to that, too. So he wrote Which, an open I mean, letter. Had he so. done that initially, so this is what gets me. It's like, look, dude, if you had given them that discount on that first bid, you probably would have gotten it. Yep. But So there's, you know, there's a businessman at work here in Bezos, I think, which is understandable. I mean, 99% of aerospace is run by businessmen. And then there's Musk, who is clearly a businessman, but he's obsessed with space flight, which is great for us, right? Because he's willing to take these larger risks and fly things on his own dime. And I guess I don't really understand, understand, kind of understanding that what the, the 
uh, proclaimed mission of Blue Origin is supposed to be, which is similar to SpaceX in a lot of ways, why they haven't put more money up front into development to win these contracts. Do you know? Yeah. No, you know, it, it's 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 really interesting to watch because Blue Origin is doing a lot of things. They've got space tourist flights with the new Shepard vehicle. They're building a brand new rocket, the new Glenn, which may eventually fly people into space, right? That's kind mm -hmm. of a... a a tote pole, a a a, a, tar, tent a, a a tent pole. Pardon me. Yeah, that's that's what I'm looking yeah. for. Uh, a tent pole for for them. Uh, they've got these new engines that they're building, not just for themselves, but they're building it for uh, uh, the United Launch Alliance as well for their new right. Vulcan rocket. And and they're also b building Project Coin for this giant mega internet constellation uh, that they've just gone on a buying spree uh, to compete for, with, with SpaceX. To compete with SpaceX. Right? Yeah. That's a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, kitchens to be cooking in uh, yeah. all at one time. And then on top of that is this Moonlander uh, contract and perhaps other things that are coming down the pipeline for that. So, so there is, there's a, at least a perception of kind of being real scattershot about what they're targeting and not, not a really clear focus. Uh, and we we really need to see how things really come together. And it could be that they all come together very quickly. You've got the Blue Origin BE-4, the uh, rocket engine that is both for the Vulcan rocket and also for their New Glenn that comes together. Uh, it's, you know, it's years behind schedule, but it comes together for the New Glenn rocket, which then would inform their moon lander because they would need a, a new engine for that moon lander as well. Uh, and so, so it could all come together very, very quickly. But that's that's the big question: is they're doing all these things. They're not there yet for any of them. They don't have satellites in orbit for their constellation. They don't have the New Glenn rocket yet. And they do have the space tourist flight. So you you have to show they've flown several of those. That's that's yeah. no small feat. But uh, but you know it, they have to show some some orbital experience to show that they can get these vehicles into space they can service them in space you know refurbish them and and fuel them up and use them again which is a plan for spacex's starship and uh, and for these new new next generation vehicles we we're going to talk about that in a minute what's the plan for them they're not going to be one-offs anymore they're going to be like taxis between lunar right. orbit and the and the lunar surface well uh, so you bring up a good point which is this is designed to be sustainable and semi-permanent whereas apollo was designed to get that mission of going to the moon and doing some basic research done it was kind of a closed-end yeah. system they could have done more with it but it was kind of stretching the limits of what that technology could do whereas at least in theory what we're doing is supposed to be more robust i have to say and this is very subjective i admit but blue origin started two years before spacex Mm -hmm. And Bezos pumped a lot of money into it. I mean, for a number of years, he was pulling, he was selling a billion dollars worth, billion dollars in stock. That's right, of Amazon stock every year to fund this. And as you say, they got the tourist flights going with the new Shepard. But it's just surprising that there hasn't been faster progress made on their large rocket engines and their large rockets. If you've been to the SpaceX plant in L.A., and again, I admit this is very subjective the dedication to the goal is pretty clear. I mean, it's the GM of rockets. It stretches off kind of into almost like that last scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark. You kind of look <laughs> off, you see parallel lines converging. It's so big. And there's, I don't know now, eight or 9,000 employees there building rocket engines, building rocket stages, helping Elon capture, I think, last count, 65% of the global launch market. And you see and feel that dedication. Now, I haven't been to Blue Origins plant in Washington, I did talk to an aerospace engineer that recently toured their facilities at the Cape, and I I was at Kennedy uh, about a year ago and saw them from the outside. And they've got an enormous plant there. So between that right. and whatever is happening in Texas and in Kent, Washington, there's a big footprint. We just, as an outsider, we kind of keep waiting for the result, right? Well, and I think that's why you saw a few years ago Jeff Bezos step away from the day-to-day -day operations at Amazon to really dedicate attention to where he wanted to see it. So he is uh, involved, uh, you know, for, for Blue Origin to really kind of push. And we saw a lot of interaction. He was calling out Elon Musk on Twitter. Uh, he was tweeting all, um, uh, and, and pushing. There's, there, there was a, during this whole kerfuffle about the moon lander, there was a lot of back and forth about uh, what SpaceX could do versus what Blue Origin could do. Right. Uh, how complicated right. a Starship is. And because Starship is not 
uncomplicated. We should point that out. You mentioned there's a orbital refueling. It's not just one mission. Elon has said it could be 16 Starship launches to support a trip to the moon with, right. with Starship. Uh, and uh, Jeff Bezos has you know said more than that, you know, in the 20s or so. Uh, Blue Origin has come out to say it's going to be at least ten missions just to get Starship to the moon. Theirs would, they would, they would do it in six missions with New Glenn, uh, and and their their lander. Uh, their mission, their, their their vehicle is something like twenty feet off the ground. Once it gets on the ground, uh, where the, the astronauts would have to take take ladders down. SpaceX is going to have them, you know, hundred hundred feet up, you know, with this this elevator crane thing to lower down. Those aren't those aren't small challenges uh for both of those vehicles uh and but now, it was excuse really me public. why why six missions for for the blue origin lander i thought that was going to be a single launch mission uh no so the the, the this this is, is it for fuel? fueling uh, it's it's most likely fuel so the, I'm, I'm looking right now at a um a, a a an image that uh blue origin shared it was an infographic that they put out uh well mm -hmm. my, my 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 mistake it's not it's not uh it's not six; it's three. So it's three, okay. uh, three launches. So you've got you've got the landers and all and the fuel and all of that to get them off the off the ground. So that's that's that was a mistake on on my part. But yeah, the the the, the big um, uh, the big takeaway is that they said that you know they would they would have their their landing module, their ascent module, and their fuel to get there, their stage to get there, uh, and SpaceX would have one giant rocket and then a bunch of other giant rockets to fuel up that, that giant rocket uh, and then get the giant rocket to, to the moon. Um, so we've still got a lot to, a, a lot to see if they're going to be able to, del to deliver on these things. SpaceX, you know, hasn't made it to orbit yet with Starship. Um, Blue Origin hasn't made it to orbit at all. Uh, and we need to see them kind of hit those milestones. Uh, those are the next big steps. You were asking about that earlier. The next steps yeah. is SpaceX needs to get to orbit with Starship. And that's just the empty hull uh, to show that they can get there and and right. come back. Uh, and then after that, they have to outfit all of the the crew systems, like the, the life support and all of that. They've got that pipeline built because they've sold the flights already to a billionaire, which means they've got the money to do it themselves. Uh, Blue Origin is working in the background. We're not sure what they're doing, but they're they're making good good ground on space tourism. So, but we've talked a lot about the landers, and we haven't really talked about the other stuff they need when they get there. Uh, they don't have spacesuits. They don't have uh, rovers yet. There are plans for those, but they're even less concrete than um, uh, with maybe maybe a, an exception to the spacesuits, right? Because NASA has a lot of time invested in next generation spacesuits with. Uh, you know, hard upper torsos or, you know, ball joints that are impervious to lunar dust. They've been working on a lot of that. So, so that, that is another field of technology. These, these landers are going to need when they, when they go, uh, whether or not the pressurized rovers have those, those kind of built in suits where you climb into them, but they're sticking out on the backside. Right. Of they're the attached rover. to the outside on an airlock. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really, that's really crazy and really, really wild. I'd like to see that happen. That way you don't need an airlock on your, right. Uh, on your rover or, or you don't need an airlock or you don't need a, um, uh, you don't need to depressurize the whole thing to, right. To right. get people out. So, you just so th those really are the next steps. It, it, it is interesting though. Uh, you brought up the EVA suits. Um, that's one thing that I'm surprised they're not bringing forward more of the 1960s technology than they are because, uh, admittedly, the Apollo suits were designed for one EVA. They're expensive. They were hard to build. They have to be built for that astronaut. They weren't modular like the modern shuttle era suits are. But we haven't actually ordered a new batch of suits of any size for, I don't know, what is it now, 25 years since earlier in the shuttle program. They got and like, none what, of those like were really... They got like 12 so had, EMUs left, something like that? Yeah, and they're wearing yeah. out, which is one of those reasons that, that some of the women had trouble getting started on their spacewalks because the, the man-rated suits that they were supposed to wear didn't fit properly. Um, and they're old and they're worn, and they, they kind of use, you know, run them out for their life and then uh, repair them when they, when they bring them back to Earth, which isn't very often. But, and I, so I realized, you know, you can't just take the Apollo was the AL-7, I think it was, was the last suit that, design that they had, suit, and expect that to be usable over the long term on the moon. But yeah. at least for the first couple of Artemis missions, which really are sorties, 
uh, you know, their excursions, why not go back to that design? And as you say, they've got a lot of money in, uh, invested in these more durable, hopefully reusable technologies, but it's been, to use your word, a kerfuffle. And uh, <laughs> at one point, space, you know, they were admit, NASA admitted, look, we're really behind the eight ball on this, and SpaceX offered to design them a new EVA suit. I don't think that there was any contract <laughs> let for that, but... Uh, well, we're going to need to see one, right? Because idea. because Dover, which has... Dover, the company, has, has designed ones. Uh, there's a few others, a few other companies. Uh, Collins, I think, is another one that, that right. has... Uh, a moon suit that they that they had they, they debuted to Johnson Space Center has like three different designs. Some of them have like day glow neon lights on them that looks like Buzz right. Lightyear, uh, and and there are other really wild ones. And it's like it's like every five years you get a new design. Infinity and beyond for these <laughs> for these suits. But but you know so we're, we've been talking about the lunar landers. Then we're going to need to see an actual contract to build the EVA suit because again yeah. you don't want to land and then not go outside. I think that the astronauts would be a little upset by that. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, and then, let me just open the, the door for a second. Let me just open it for we've a got second. The, we've got, I'll come back real quick. We've got the moon rover too. You know, we talked a bit about Toyota in Japan for a pressurized right. moon rover, but NASA does it had put out a call just recently. I want to, I want to say, for an unpressurized rover. So kind of think of the the lunar rover Mark II uh, mm. that we might have seen. We, we were talking about Ad Astra in that Space Movies episode where they have a big car chase on the moon oh, you know something God. that's that's a version of that that's more robust that you can use over and over again that you can recharge a lot easier uh, okay but if i may say for that stupid hideous awful movie that nobody should allow <laughs> themselves or their families or loved ones to see oh i did it i'm sorry i'm sorry that far in the future yeah you lit the fuse that far in the future <laughs> they're still using apollo lunar rovers i didn't see any upgrade or any updating of that thing in that goofy chase. And by the way, lunar rovers only went a top speed of 15 miles an hour. Well, that's so, the upgrade. They dumb, can go faster. Dumb, they can hold more dumb, people. Dumb. <laughs> okay. Just well. dumb. Bad. And then there was the monkey scene. Do we have to go there? Oh, my God. Well, no, we're not. That, that doesn't have to do with moon landing at all, Rod. Let's get back. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little obsessed here. Uh, and and I, I should point out, by the way, um, and again, if you if you want to learn all about this, go to space.com. They have a good search engine there. You can look up any of these things you want. Uh, Blue Origin it does also uh, factor space habitats into their their, right. their calculus, which SpaceX That's doesn't. Right. And they are now trying to build or, or getting ready to build Orbital Reef with with partners also, Sierra which is a space fairly large. Hmm? Sierra Space and other partners. That's right. Right, which is a fairly large, you know, it's a profound habitat that will be one of the few things still in orbit when the ISS is deorbited. I think it doesn't go up to the, the late twenties at the earliest, right? Yeah, and there's a few. It's not just it's not it's not just Blue Origin with orbital reef. Right. There's a few other private space stations right now that uh, we should be talking about uh, probably in the yeah. near the near future. But not today, my friend, because we have devoured a full hour. And it's time for us to say goodbye to our vast, vast audience. So, Tarek, as always, I want to thank you for your participation and remind us where we can learn more about your spacely activities. Well, you can hey, always man, you. follow me on the Twitter. You can always follow me on the Twitter at Tarek J. Malik. And, uh, and I'm at space.com weighing in. You know, we've had a, a lot of exciting things coming up and a lot of exciting things uh uh, coming up, actually, uh, this the week that this that we're we're taking right now because on May twenty eighth, twenty ninth, and um, and thirtieth, we've got some planets in the night sky, and I just wanted to give a uh, uh, a shout out that you will be able to see Jupiter and Mars uh, super close in the morning sky on May twenty eighth, twenty ninth, and thirtieth. So we'll be looking for that. Oh, I see Ant has up that goofy picture of you on your Twitter That's account. right. That's what, right. That's what right. If you go to my Twitter... You're pointing to a go, rocket over your shoulder, but you got this expression like, oh, that hurts. What was that expression I am, for? I am pointing very excitedly to the first Starship, SN1. So if ah. you want to see what the very first Starship looked like, uh, you can go to my Twitter and you'll see that on my, my profile photo. Sadly, that, that Starship is no more. It blew up when they tried to yeah. land it after the first launch. But you know what? At least your publication sent you to see it. Oh, there I go again. Um, well, thank one you. Day, and at, one day, if people, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just start writing my own checks. 
Uh, people can find more on me at my Facebook account, which is under my name. I'm on uh, Twitter at Christyplanatia, spelled with an A. And on Instagram, where we are now putting up our funny new series of commercials. You'll love them. <laughs> at Rod Pile Books. Uh, my magazine is Ad Astra. You can find that at adastramagazine.com. And of course, you can find space.com at wait for it, space.com. <laughs> so uh, be sure to check it out and uh, be sure to get back to us. So as always, please feel free to send us feedback, good, bad, or indifferent, at TWIS at twit.tv. We publish new episodes every Friday. And they're available on your favorite podcatcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and just about everywhere else you, you might manage to stumble around looking for podcasts. Uh, be sure to review us. Tell your friends. We love to spread the word and the gospel. And uh, you can always head over to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS, and we will see you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit, and thanks for your support.